let's say you have a relatively young female come into your emergency department, let's say 40s, 50s years old with shortness of breath and some mild tachycardia, no real significant risk factors. Now, if you're like me, I might just order an EKG, get some basic labs, and maybe a chest x-ray in the area in which we are in now, probably get a COVID swab, and kind of wait for that stuff to come back to try and figure out what to do with this patient. Now, I am going to talk to you about a case that Dr. Lindsay Reardon shared with me relatively recently about basically an identical patient. The difference in this case is Dr. Reardon took with her into the room on her initial evaluation a point of care ultrasound machine and within seconds was able to diagnose this stable, other than tachycardia, patient with a life-threatening abnormality before she died, which is phenomenal. It is such a good catch and such an amazing case. So amazing. I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Now, what's cool about this podcast is I'm actually going to split it up into two parts. So in part one, I'm going to talk to you about the case with Dr. Lindsay Reardon, as well as Dr. Peter Weimersheimer, who's the ultrasound director out there in Vermont, where Dr. Reardon works. And then in part two, I'm going to speak with a cardiologist who actually took care of the patient after that initial diagnosis and hear his perspective on us using point of care ultrasound, us being emergency providers to help diagnose our patients with these life-threatening abnormalities. Check it out. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. Hello, this is Jacob Avila of the Ultrasound Podcast. And today I have two special guests. Now, we have one guy who is a fairly frequent guest on the podcast, Peter Weimersheimer, who is the professor of emergency medicine, professor of surgery, emergency medicine, something, and the clinical ultrasound director and the EM conference director at the University of Vermont in Vermont. And we have a first time guest, um, somebody who I met a couple of months ago. I saw her lecture. She does a phenomenal job. Great educator. And I'm assuming a great physician as well, if it's anything like um, how she educates. Lindsay Reardon, who is an assistant professor of emergency medicine and the assistant ultrasound director at the University of Vermont. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. We're doing great. Great to see you, Jacob. Thanks. Great to see you too, Lindsay. The last time that yeah. we hung out, we barely made it out of Columbia in time. It was like right during yeah. this whole coronavirus stuff started. And I think like yeah. two days after I left, there was talks of like nobody being able to leave. So I'm, I'm, it, it seems like you look like you're in your home, I guess. You, you made it out of there okay? I made it home. It was, it, it actually got pretty dicey. I stayed for a few more days after yeah. you left. And I think I made it back just in time before everything really, really got hairy for people. A lot of our colleagues actually got stuck in Columbia. So we were fortunate to get back on time wow. and also not to be quarantined from work yeah, um, yeah. and not to get sick, not to get exposed to anybody. So uh, thankfully, everybody at the conference is healthy and doing well. And it was a phenomenal group of people. So I was pretty excited to be a part of that whole that whole thing. Yeah, it was, it was super It's a fun. life-changing conference. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that was I think I went to Cuba yeah. a few years ago um and then this year this is of course for developing EM uh which this year was in Cartagena, Colombia. Super fun trip. Um but what I want to talk about today is there's this case. Now, I used to be on Twitter a lot more than I am now, but I happened to be on Twitter towards the end of February and I saw a case of what looked like pretty classic tamponade findings um, that had a pretty interesting case about it. And I uh, texted Peter and he said that Lindsay was the one who had the case. And I was hoping you guys could <laughs> kind of walk me through um, exactly what happened. Okay. So I'd love to review the case. So this was a 59-year-old female that came in looking really well. She was triaged to a back room. And again, I'm in a community site. I'm not at our academic hospital. So I'm seeing all the patients on my own and doing all my own ultrasounds. And uh, I had just seen, we have a, a very high population of dyspnea there. So I see a lot of COPD, a lot of CHF. Um, I walked into the room expecting to see one of these things. And the woman was not in any distress. Her vital signs were stable other than she was tachycardic to the 140s. So 
She definitely had some significant tachycardia, but her blood pressure looked fine. And she looked good. She had a friend in the room. She was actually fully dressed and uh, not in any distress, no increased work of breathing. So walking into the room, I was my, my guard was certainly down for something that was going to be a truly life-threatening diagnosis. And um, once I put the probe on her chest, the first thing I saw was a pretty large pericardial effusion. She had told me in her history that she had a procedure. She had had something done to her heart. It turns out that she had had an ablation, but it was back two months prior. So it was it was a little bit remote at that point. It wasn't anything immediate. And she hadn't even thought to tell me that in the beginning. Most patients with dyspnea, tachycardia, I'm throwing the ultrasound probe on their chest. But for her in particular, I'm thinking, well, she just recently had this procedure. What types of complications might go with that? But I'm going to be honest, tamponade was really not in my mind at the time at all. It really wasn't on my differential when I walked in the room. I thought maybe she had gone back into an arrhythmia or potentially was having problems with heart failure. And so when I threw the probe on her chest, my first image was a pretty obvious case of tamponade and and it surprised me. And it's, it's always funny in those circumstances when you try to hide your facial expression from the patient when you see something on ultrasound and then try to talk them through it. But I think, you know, my first my first reaction was, "Whoa, <laughs> this looks bad." <laughs> you know, um, but I really lucked out because Joel Wolkowitz, who's our cardiologist, one of them was on call, and so when I looked at the call sheet and saw that it was him, I was pretty happy because he's very receptive to the emergency physicians doing the point of care ultrasounds, calling him with the findings, and I've never had any pushback. Uh, you know, needing a, a formal follow up or anything like that. He's very receptive to us. So I think that's a pretty great work environment to be in. Before we talk about like what happened like down the road, we should probably discuss like a little more about how the patient presented. So she, since she was Mm -hmm. in tamponade, right? Sonographic tamponade, she definitely had hypotension and she definitely had tachycardia and definitely had an elevated respiratory rate, right? Actually, she wasn't really hypotensive. Yeah. So when I look back, I just want to look at her vitals. She was definitely tachycardic when she came in, in the 140s, but her blood pressure was in the one teens, I think. So it, maybe that was hypotensive for her, but it wasn't, you know, hypotension that was raising a flag at the time for me. Gotcha. So this is somebody who basically had like undifferentiated dyspnea, and you're able to find something mm-hmm. um, that is easily reversible and relatively easily reversible um, fairly quickly that you might not have been able to, you know, figure out if you hadn't used your ultrasound, right? So what I what I would imagine if I didn't have an ultrasound or if another provider had seen this patient was um, doing serial EKGs, doing her lab work, there really wasn't anything that showed up. Maybe further imaging, they had gotten a formal echo, but this was pretty late at night. So I don't know that our comprehensive echo would have been available. I'm not really sure what her clinical course would have been if I hadn't discovered the tamponade right then and there, because she really wasn't exhibiting clear signs or symptoms or a good reason. She didn't have any signs on her EKG or anything that would have pointed me in that direction otherwise. But using the point of care ultrasound, I diagnosed it within 30 seconds. And so I think it was it was just such a clear example of how useful this is at the bedside for us. Yeah, I agree 100%. Peter, how are you diagnosing tamponade? Well, I was going to say that to be clear, we've had multiple cases of thoracic dissections in our shop, some of which have been diagnosed relatively early with a point of care ultrasound, and some of them unfortunately have been less rapidly diagnosed with the standard of care. So there, there's no question that uh, being able to throw a transducer on somebody's chest and even see a pericardial effusion is enough that if you have a patient who's presenting with some sort of atypical symptoms, whether it be dyspnea or hypotension or presyncope, uh, just seeing an effusion at all by ultrasound is something which is a red flag for early tamponade. Uh, back to how am I do- diagnosing uh, tamponade? Uh, I think the first the first question I'm asking at all is, am I seeing an effusion or not? And then in the right circumstances, if it doesn't make sense that a patient should have an effusion, that's already something that's going to trigger my workup to be more aggressive. Um, I guess going from a fusion to something that's clinically symptomatic, early on, patients with tamponade may be hypertensive. They may not be tachycardic. They may just start having some change in uh, cardiac physiology. So I think for me, uh, 
Um, just seeing any type of variation in wall motion, right? The idea is that the pericardium is usually a lower pressure and should be a lower pressure than intraventricular filling pressures. And all of a sudden, when you start seeing variation in that ventricular wall motion, that means that at some point as the heart is expanding in diastole, that there's some limitation on that wall moving out. And so you start seeing some weird motions. And so you know that gets discussed as the man jumping on a trampoline, different, different signs, different uh, terminology. But for me, just seeing any variation in wall motion means that the pressure in the pericardium is now at some point exceeding diastolic pressure, even briefly. And so those are the patients who may not be actively uh, needing a, an emergent pericardiocentesis, but I'm certainly concerned that they are going to worsen and fail. Now, Lindsay, there was one other, I guess, organ that you, another part of the body that you examined that helped kind of clinch the diagnosis. Could you talk <laughs> about that? Sure. And and Joel had mentioned this as well. The fact that I was able to tell him that he there was a plethoric IVC was was pretty high on his list of being able to determine that this was tamponade that needed more emergent treatment for sure, taking the patient to the cath lab more emergently in the evening rather than waiting until the morning. I think if if we didn't have at least three of the elements, she definitely had RV collapse in diastole. And I was able to tell him that I saw some right atrial collapse as well. And that's in systole. So we have to be able to see the difference, like what Peter talked about with the man on the trampoline. Sometimes that's a more obvious finding, but then looking at the IVC is another really important element. And um, especially in this case with tamponade physiology, showing that that there is the actual increased pressure and the IVC will be have less respiratory variation as well. So that's something I was able to tell him over the phone that made him really feel like this patient needed to go right now to be managed. Absolutely. And that's one of the, I guess, the things that is important to me with talking about tamponade and talking specifically about like ultrasound and tamponade is the fact that if you are waiting until the patient has, you know, clinical tamponade, you're waiting until essentially it's too late to do something about it effectively. In fact, I mean, if you look at the cardiology literature, the majority of patients with sonographic or cath tamponade actually are hypertensive, right? So if you're waiting until mm -hmm. they crash to like say it's tamponade, you're like way behind the eight ball here. And it sounds like that is what you avoided doing by doing your ultrasound in this particular case. You know, you found somebody that didn't, you know, was a little bit sick, but not super sick. And you were able to mm -hmm. get them to the cath lab in a controlled environment to get this tamponade fixed instead of doing a crash pericardiosynthesis in the emergency department, which... For the record, I love doing. I mean, I, I hate that I have to do it, but it's one of like my favorite procedures to do, right? But it shouldn't really be done in the ED. Like we should be finding these patients before we have to do it in the ED and sending them to, if you are, you know, in a facility that maybe doesn't have a cardiologist or a cath lab, being able to send it to a place that has it before the patient crashes is of, I think, utmost importance. Yeah, I think the point is that if you have a crashing patient, um, it's our role as emergency physicians to be able to do a crash pericardiocentesis. And yes, it's really fun to do. But for the most part, the patients we're seeing are symptomatic and they're at some spectrum of their symptomatology. So they could be early or they may not even go to full-fledged tamponade. But once we have a patient who has some instability or some sense of instability and we've diagnosed that there's a pericardial effusion, that's the real opportunity to get someone else involved or some other level of care that there's a safer way to manage the patients that's a more controlled procedure if it's, if needed. Absolutely. That was an amazing case and really shows why you have to think about ultrasound in your dyspneic patient. And really, any time that you have a patient that really has any kind of complaint that there is a chance that ultrasound might be beneficial, if you have the time for it, and most of the time we do, just throw that ultrasound transducer on them. I usually do my ultrasound examination while I'm taking the history and doing the rest of my physical examination. So it doesn't really take up any more of my time. And I found it makes me a lot more efficient when managing my patients. Do you guys agree? Yeah. One thing I think it's important that I think most of us, when we're doing undifferentiated dyspnea, you know, dyspnea means lung to some people. Mm -hmm. And clearly, 
uh, there can be other things besides lungs that can make that uh, uh, that happen. So the cool mm-hmm. thing about being a little more thorough is that if you think someone is undifferentiated dyspnea, certainly look at the lungs. But in this case, I, I wonder if this woman's lungs would have been clear. But by virtue of Lindsay taking the transducer and actually looking at the heart and the IVC, she's now framed the cause of dyspnea in a much different diagnosis than maybe a COPD exacerbation mm-hmm. or bronchitis. So and I think an important teaching point, if you're looking at cardiac etiology, then don't forget to look at the lungs. If you're looking at a dyspnea or potentially lung etiology, don't forget to just take that extra minute and take at least one view of the heart and look at the IVC and have a little more information to frame your patient. And that's a, a really cool thing about this case. Agreed. Well, thank you guys so much for stopping by virtually because we can't actually hang out anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know. We how are socially we're... distanced. <laughs> we are socially distancing. <laughs> um, but thanks so much. And uh, hopefully, point. hopefully we'll be able to see a lot more of these cases on Twitter. When I hear the phrase that tamponade is a clinical diagnosis, I get a little bit impatient. I mean, waiting for your patient to be hypotensive from tamponade is really waiting too long to do something about this patient's pathology. As I mentioned in the podcast, the vast majority of patients that are in a sonographic or cath tamponade, so they have a gold standard diagnosis of tamponade, are actually hypertensive. They're not hypotensive. I think that we really should keep that in mind. If you see right ventricular diastolic collapse on your ultrasound, that patient is in tamponade. That's actually when you want to catch it. You want to catch it before they actually have hemodynamic collapse because you can get that patient to a controlled setting to actually do that pericardiocentesis or that pericardial window in a controlled environment. Much better for the patient. Stay tuned in the next couple of days for part two, where I speak with Dr. Joel Wolkowitz, the cardiologist who ended up taking care of this patient to hear his words on it. Stay tuned.